the one. I'm pulling up my notes here. All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of Composites Weekly, the industry's leading podcast show. Um, this episode, uh, before we get started, I want to mention today's episode is made possible by the uh, ACMA's Education Hub. It is the industry destination for composites resources for CCT training and testing, recorded webinars, uh, conference proceedings, uh, uh, regulatory information, customized manufacturing training, and more. Uh, their program supports uh, professional development and facilitates uniform training and technical skills. It's the only certification uh, program of its kind in the industry, and this program is completed online and provides all enrollees with the resources that, that they need for becoming a certified composites technician. Uh, so if you have anyone within your organization that needs to get um, their CCT certification, uh, you can go over to um, their website today over at acmaeducationhub.org. Uh, that would be the place to get started. You can register. It's quick and easy. Uh, of course, if your company or organization has specific composite manufacturing uh, training that they would like um, that's more customized to them, they can request it and you can reach out to their team at uh, cct at acmanet.org uh, for specific needs and uh, also training and material quotes. Well, today I'm excited. We've got a, a couple of gentlemen joining me. Um, I've got, first of all, Peter Hedger. He's the VP of Business Development at Composite Application Group. Uh, Peter's co-hosted with me on the show. He's been on a number of times. Um, so I'm excited to have him. And on today's show, we've got, um, uh, we've got Martin McLaughlin. He's going to be joining us uh, to discuss a recent article that he published highlighting um, some best practices and uh, discussing Ocean Gates, uh, the submersible's recent implosion. We're going to be discussing more along the lines of, from his experience, Martin's experience, some of the best practices to use. Um, obviously, that accident's still under investigation, so we're not going to be speculating and coming to any conclusions Um on the whole and, and how that disaster happened. But we do want to highlight some practices that are, um, uh, that are best to use. Uh, some things from uh, Martin's article uh, will be helpful, I think, for a, a number of, you know, so many people out there, so many of our listeners. Uh, Martin is the owner of McLaughlin Aerospace. Um, he has 22 years of experience in tactical aircraft and B-2 development. He has 17 years of space transportation systems development experience. He's also has uh, related technology development and demonstrations, including advanced composite structures and composite cryogenic propellant tanks. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, he's now the founder of uh, McLaughlin Aerospace, LLC, where he continues his interest in cislunar space and hydrogen systems. Um, Martin has also been involved in uh, accident investigations throughout his career. Um, so he's got some uh, keen insight into this. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of speculation um, that the uh, Titan was, uh, the implosion was due to uh, composite cylinder fatigue after repeated dives. But we're not going to assume anything until obviously, um, you know, there's going to be, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of information coming from, uh, from that investigation, but it's always fascinating to discuss this. And with that said, I'm going to open up the mics for uh, our guest today, Peter, Martin, thanks for coming on. Oh, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, thanks. Uh, nice to meet you, Peter. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, five brave people died in this accident. Yeah. I, I, we got to keep that in mind. And I, Absolutely. Yeah. I feel yeah. sorry for their uh, loved ones. Yes. Um, I, I, I did too. I, I was, you know, it, it's, you, you start thinking about the personal aspect and families that are, that are impacted. So uh, obviously we want to be respectful, but, you know, I think that you offered some, some very, uh, some keen insights on, just how things were, how how this um, the hull was made, how you know this submersible uh, was made um, during the fabrication, and maybe you can share just some of your own insight during the you know composite shell fabrication. We'll get into that, um, 
I guess maybe before we get into that, Martin, why don't you get, give our listeners, um, and Peter, feel free to jump in at any time, but give us a little background on on, on your experience. I know you have quite a bit of um, uh, experience in uh, aerospace uh, development, and uh, obviously you have background in physics. So if you would kind of give us, talk to us about you know your background before we get started on the topic today. Well, I first got exposed to advanced composites and actually in Olympic class sailboats back in the early 70s. And I sailed in the uh, 72, 76, 80, and 84 Olympic trials. And um, I, did, I did have a physics degree and I had planned to go back and, and was in space physics. I was planned to go back and get a graduate degree in that. But after the 1980 Olympic trials, I was so interested in composites that I went back to the University of Wisconsin and I asked the engineering professor, where should I go to school to learn about composites? And he kicked me out of his office. He said, go get a job. You know, 1980, <laughs> there wasn't anybody, you know, teaching composites. It was, you know, you would learn it in the industry. Right. So um, I went to work for Northrop, Northrop then. Um, uh, later, Northrop Grumman. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, you know, there was a short period of time when advanced composites was being led by Olympic class sailboats. During the 80s and early 90s, it was really led by fighter aircraft and the B 2. And um, uh, so I got to be part of all that. I worked on the little bit on the F 5, uh, on the F 18. I built the horizontal tails for the F-20, and that was very interesting. Um, wing carry-through box on the B-2 is, uh, you can't get more primary structure than that. And that was, sure. and then um, my favorite program was the YF-23, and we, uh, that was a very interesting composites uh, project because we were having a contest of whether we could get the toughness of thermosets up or the temperature capability of thermoplastics up. There was a materials contest there. And ended up the bismoly imid composites uh, got tougher and they had great elevated temperature wet performance. And we built that whole airplane, well, a great deal of that airplane out of that. And it, and it came out great, it was lots of fun. Uh, then I went on to the, um, X-35, F-35, and I was the, uh, at that time, I, uh, you know, I was no longer a composites researcher. I was doing the layer frame and, uh, and thinking more at a system level. So I'm kind of out of date in composites. You know, I was an expert in it in the 80s and 90s, but since then, I'm, I'm now working Well, let's, at, let's be clear, Martin. You're, you're out of date with composites. It's cutting <laughs> edge for probably 99% of the population. Yeah, really. So, yeah. I mean, you've probably yeah. figured out more about composites than I'll ever know, and I'm supposed to be on the cutting edge. So let's, <laughs> let's just let's set the record straight and level set everybody's expectations. Well, okay, but I, I've been working at the uh, vehicle level or even at the architecture level in some of these space applications. Yeah. And... Um, uh, ever since. And that's what I'm doing at McLaughlin Aerospace. We're doing conceptual designs with a merry band of retirees. And uh, <laughs> if we can get it, uh, a concept, we're working on a space plane right now. I've got a meeting on it coming up in an hour. Fantastic. If we can get that uh, mature enough, uh, then we'll take it to government and industry and see if we can get it developed. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. But, uh, you know, what I would like to talk about for starters is, is a couple of misconceptions about composites. You know, composites has been a lightning rod and still is, you know. Right. And it was very disappointing when this well, was disappointing that this accident happened. It was also disappointing now that, you know, people jumped on the, on the composite shell. And yeah. Yep. Yeah. It should have been made. You know, what, what were they thinking? All yeah. Stuff. What are they thinking? Uh, why would anybody want to make it out of composites when that's a new technology and, you know, yeah. nobody knows anything about it? Yeah. Well, you know, um, the very first use of advanced composites, you know, a, a high strength, high stiffness fiber reinforcement, not fiberglass, but boron or, or, mm -hmm. or graphite, carbon fiber. We're for supersonic aircraft horizontal tails. 
that. You know? And those are safety of flight critical components. And that was the first application of composites. And there's no warning. If a horizontal tail delaminates or disbonds, the, the, the torsional stiffness goes south. The bending mode couples with the torsional mode, it flutters and it rips off the airplane in a millisecond or two. Yep. Yeah. And you don't even have time to jet, right? That's right. And every supersonic fighter since the F-14, American ones, has had a composite tail. Okay. Yep. I built the composite tails for the F-20. And I knew what it took to get those qualified or certified, you know, and it was a lot. But, uh, and there was no forgiveness. That's right. And there's never been an accident in any of those supersonic uh, fighters due to the horizontal tails. It certainly can be done. And you also, you know, you can make safety of flight or mission critical components that have, that you can't solve by redundancy. You can't say, well, I have another horizontal tail because the first one breaks, right? <laughs> You know, um, well, I think Martin, too, I think uh, what's important to note as well is that those composite parts were also it was that that structure wasn't all composites. Right. And so there was multi-material um, usage and that and where those materials came yeah, together. There's that's science that's between that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the F-20 had a um, aramid steel uh, torque tube uh, bonded into composite ribs and spars and um, full depth aluminum honeycomb core. And so, yeah, there's differential materials in there. I'm glad you brought that up. The, um, the FA-18 um, wing attach lugs and vertical tail lugs are titanium step lap fittings that are co-bonded into the composite skin. So there's a case, you know, where uh, we built over 2000 F-18s and there's eight of those per ship set you know, there, there's, there's, that's, you can't get more mature technology than that. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay. And you can't yeah. have a more uh, primary load path than that. Okay. Right. And also the upper wing skin and a rolling pull up is a huge compression load. So, and so, and so I think it's safe to say, I think it's safe to say that this isn't, this isn't composites first rodeo. This yeah. is like we're, we're no, taking no. experimental technology and 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 dropping no. it to the bottom of the ocean. That's just not what happened. That's just not. Yeah, and and, not and it doesn't. And composites doesn't delaminate when you put it in seawater. You know. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Jillian, it yeah. Sure. Didn't it make we read some out. articles on that? Did they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's been some ridiculous sound bites and um, you know uh, out there. So, so what what went wrong? You know, we don't know because we don't have access to the information. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about now, you know, if you were doing that kind of product development, and I've been, um, you know, a technical program manager. Well, Martin, let me ask you this, too, before you get started, too. Yeah. I'd also like to possibly address, because um, I'd like to address on the front end, like, what your thoughts of best practices for the build was. But then oh, there's also, yeah. obviously, um, and I've been involved with and seen a lot of projects for maintaining proper practices for fatigue life and for examining in in this case would be with my experience would be aircraft right and so because there's certain fatigue life that you got to make sure and got to test to make sure that the composite quality and the laminate structure is still is still accessible is still valid is still strong like that it's going to continue to maintain what it was designed to do both of those have to be coupled together. You can't just say, oh, I built a great, it's going to last forever and then never test it again. Right. right. And so those 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 planes that you were building go through rigorous continued testing to make sure that they still are flight worthy. Correct. Well, a lot of that's done up front. And then there is there are, you know, periodic um, inspections uh, that are established by your um durability and damage tolerance plan that's right which is what you you're go. getting at yeah but to to do that properly up front the first thing you have to do is is you have to say well how are we going to use this thing and that's uh, you know either driven by national security or in the case of fighters or in this, this case driven by a business plan and you know they wanted to 
their business plan must have had a, a minimum number of dives that this thing could do, you know, in its design life to pay for itself. And so they, they needed to have an understanding. It's not unlimited design life. They needed to have a business case driven. We need, we want to be able to do 200 dives or five years, whichever comes first, something like that. I mean, sure. I'm just guessing, mm -hmm. but, you know, something like that. And then you have to build a, you know, they're fortunate in this case, unlike a fighter, the loads are really determinant. You know, it, it, there's a little bit of uncertainty based on the density of the seawater and temperature of what the pressure is, but that's only like a 5% variation. So they're really, they're lucky in this, it simplifies it greatly in this application. They're gonna go down to 13,000 feet and the pressure is gonna be 6,000 PSI and they're come back up again, right? And they don't have to, in the case of a fighter, you go through an extensive um, uh, usage spectrum development. So Mar Martin, can, speaking specifically to PSI, can you give us an example of some of the PSI strain that goes on with some of the composites that go into fighter craft? So, so that we can have kind of a, a level set understanding of, of, I know pressure is different, obviously, than some of the strains that we're talking about. But PSI um, is it, for for pressure is is a little different, but there still can be some some qualitative um, understanding of some of the some of the comparisons between a pressure vessel and the strains that it has, it has to go under, and then some of the flexural strains and impact strains and fatigue that goes on in an aircraft. There's because those are tremendous forces. Because I've heard some of the some of the conversation was like, well. We put we put composites in space, and then other people are like, "Well, space is a vacuum; it's not the same kind of pressure. It's when you're going down in the ocean, you have the weight of the ocean well, on top, you, and it's a different." Yeah, kind of pressure, um, so. a lot of the applications for composites in space are propellant and and um, um, gas, gas I mean, like uh, helium tanks, right? right? And those are you know five six thousand psi. Uh, pressure vessels. That's, that's outward pressure, right? That's pressure on the inside pushing yeah, it out. Yeah, it's on the inside. And so this is a unique application. Coming from the outside, you know, there really aren't any pressure applications like that other than for submarines and submersibles. Uh, so that's unique, and that's one of the things that has to be addressed in the development of something like this. Um, so but, typically you know, for aerospace... As as external compression loads, right? Uh -huh. Again, the upper wing skins on a fighter, uh, you know, see extensive, you know, well, a 9G pull-up load, right? Yeah. yeah. You, know? Um, you know, and so that's a big deal. But how does that um, translate Translate into a stress? Right. A strain composite. That's, right. well, that's based on how you design it, right? Yeah. Right. When you design that to fall within the material allowables that you're using it. So, um, and you also, from a usage standpoint or a fatigue standpoint, you have to look at this usage spectrum and say, well, like in the case of the F-35, it's supposed to be good for 9,000 flight hours at the 90th percentile of the usage spectrum. So in other words, there's some sort of bell curve of the usage spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're supposed to be able to take an F-35 that somebody really beats up. They fly it out at the 90th percentile on that. Curve yeah. and fly that for nine thousand hours and still be okay. Okay, well that's that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Oh, and it, and it might be thirty years old by the time it does that. <laughs> yeah. You know? So yeah. you know, there's there's you can design composites for long life, essentially fatigue insensitive if you do it right. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't mean you don't check it. But you, most of it's done in the design and qualification process up front, rather than. Uh, oh, it's more common in in a um, aluminum structure like um, F one eleven. Every thousand hours, they had to de-skin the whole airplane. Right. You go through with a magnifying glass and die penetrant, checking all of the frames and and spars for cracks. And the Air Force has a uh, crack growth criteria that, you know, yeah, here's a crack. We see it. We've we've uh, we've uh, recorded it. And if it doesn't grow beyond this, we still allow the airplane to fly. Well, Navy doesn't allow that. But the Air Force right. does. 
so so Martin, that's that you bring up an excellent point because um, this will probably be part of the investigation too. Um, I don't know if they can get the data or not, but but understanding what is crack propagation within a composite and why is that important? Because when you talk about different industries, crack propagation in my bathtub is less critical than crack propagation for a boat, which is less critical than crack propagation for a fighter aircraft and understanding what that is and what that means. Like, because, because it's, it, it's not just that the whole laminate is cracked and failing because the way that composites are designed, some crack propagation is allowable but it depends on where that crack is within the lamination schedule, where it's originated. What is it on a joint? Is it on a, a different type of material around a different type of material? Is it reacting or galvanic, um, galvanic corrosion with different fittings and, and causing cracking and, and delamination? And so could you walk us through a little bit of, of like what it, what crack propagation actually is and why that's important in this conversation? Well, you know, for an application like this, you should design it for um, unlimited life with no, you know, have the stress versus cycle curve, the SN curve, uh, have the stress level low enough. In other words, have enough thickness of material there that you don't get into a, um, a cracked initiation propagation thing normally it would have to be some anomaly that did that sure um but then you have to say well is it good for that so what do you do well um the first thing we do in in aircraft is we design with open hole allowables so the material allowables the tensile and compressive strength and modulus is uh, measured in, in instrument you know in, in test machines it's actually a one inch wide coupon with a quarter inch hole in the middle of it so we're actually as part of the material allowables already assuming there's a quarter inch hole in the, in the material okay yep which, so which making a hole in composites is not as simple as just grabbing a dewalt and zh, 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 zh. yeah you can't just blow through it you can, no you can't you have all kinds of problems you have to drill it <laughs> that's why bolted joints and composites so it can be a real problem and have yeah. to mm -hmm. stay away from them that's right you know um so you know the first thing you know if you use in this application you don't you're not really expecting a lot of um damage like you would with a aircraft but still you know it could bang as it's being launched or as it's coming back up bang you know get banged by a, a, a lift hook or run into that float that they had or god knows what right sure and and you you'd have um <coughs> what you need with a big thick laminate like the one they have it's really, it, it can um, hide impact damage. It's not like it's a, you know, a 80,000 thick skin over a honeycomb where you're gonna get a puncture and you see it right away and you go in and investigate and you yep. test it, you know, and fix it, whatever. So something thick like this thing um, really needs a witness material on the surface, either a paint or a coating of some kind that'll scuff up if there's an impact like an unreported impact you know those happen even in aircraft <coughs> and so if you get a a visual uh, indication of damage then you have to go in with ultrasound or x-ray or whatever <coughs> and um, find out what's going on and fix it if necessary or replace it so uh, that brings up a good point. So that you're talking about damage detection. I think I think that's important to understand that there's many methods of damage detection, and and it's on the um there's there's post build damage detection, and yep. then there's there's pre build installed intelligence that that's more recent, right? And and maybe you could talk to some <coughs> of the, some of the embedded technology that you can put in there. I know um, Luna Technologies uh, has a fiber optic damage detector. Um, there's other RFIDs like a company, Synthesis. I know I'm dropping names, Jonathan. I hope that's okay. Oh, um, yeah. 
but uh, these companies provide sensors that can be embedded in composites that can be tuned to specific strain, pressure, temperature, um, mm -hmm. also damage tolerance. Um, but that would have to be thoughtful on the front end, right? That's that it needs to be in, in, embedded into the composite structure. You're talking about structural health monitoring and how do Correct. you how do you do that? And there's that's one area that I haven't kept up on because there was a lot of work on that in the '80s, and most of it uh, didn't work. Well, but, so uh, and non-destructive like, testing too. So let's be clear. One of my callouts very very early on in my career was. Um, so I was in the adhesives, right? Because it like you talked about with bolting, you don't want to bolt composites, you want to glue them because A, the composite is going to behave a lot better, but but also you have a more continuous bond. And that bond is, right. That's right. You're distributing your load. But um in but in order to get adhesives into an aerospace, like it, it when you're torquing down bolts, you have a call out for the you need to torque it to XPSI and then it's secure, right? When you're when you're gluing. Like there's no, it's very difficult to say, okay, so you wait till the exotherm hits X temperature and then the glue is solid. Right. And so the way that they do their non, their testing is not non-destructive. It's destructive testing. So in order to test in a, a bond joint, they've got to rip a bunch apart and they got to make sure that they get a hundred percent failure at the exact level that they're looking for before they can validate that bond. But they still like, it's still like, okay, I hope it cured type of scenario. There's not a lot of embedded technology yeah. inside of there. And so that was one of the call outs. Cause when I went through, I was, you know, I was young and I was fresh and I, I went through uh, Northrop Grumman actually in Southern California. And I saw all these beautiful planes being built and then all of these beautiful composites and then they're perforating them. Right. So they're taking all this great yeah. carbon fiber skins and then they're just drilling a bunch of holes in them. And all I think of in the back of my head is like, that looks just like the paper that I rip out of a notebook that's perforated. Why would I want to do that? Like, why can't you do that solid and glue? Well, there's a lot of bonded structure, too. Uh, there, is, said, there is. They said that uh, titanium step lap fitting, there's no chicken fasteners through that. That would just make it worse. So, well, okay. you just said step lap fitting. Explain that because that is a joining method, correct? Yeah, the, the, the wing attach fitting is a titanium forging that has a, a, a lug on it that attaches to the fuselage, right? Mm -hmm. With a big pin. Mm -hmm. And as it goes into the composite, it steps down, mm -hmm. you know, um, oh, about 10 thousandths each step as it goes out into the part. Yep. And skin is interleaved on top and bottom. So, there, you know, you're building up plies top and bottom in this step lap, you know. Yep. And it's controlled by rigorous in-process controls that were originally qualified through um, – structural certification, you know, and, and way back in the late 70s. And um, and then again, when the ENF was done, the uh, there's there's process controls. One of the things on the uh, on that particular fitting, bonding titanium is tricky and it's um, it's uh, very dependent on the primer. So you have to you have to um, um, you have to develop those up front with building block test plan. You know, you start out with materials. You, you have to understand the usage of the loads. Then that with materials, and you go to elements, and you go to panels, and then components, and then finally a full scale uh, qualification article. And once you have that done, now then when the qualification's done, and that's a dedicated article, then is that never flies because it um, there's a lot of confusion in the world about factor safety. The you just you, you come up first with a what is the max expected load that you would ever see in service, uh, and that's called the design limit load. And then you put a factor of safety on that, and for human systems, it's typically 1.5. So 1.5 times the design limit load is a design ultimate load. And that's what you analyze to. And then you build a dedicated structural test article and test it to design ultimate load. That's what wasn't done on Seagate. And now you have, you have a uh, ocean gate. What, if have, it exceeds that DLL, what happens? Is it, do they, do they decertify it? 
it's well the, the there's a dedicated qualification article that is then expended after it's gone to ultimate okay mm -hmm. any in use vehicle can never go above design limit load if you get above design, design limit load it's decertified okay now it's possible okay. if it was a if it was a small excursion that you can go back and do a whole bunch of inspections to make sure it wasn't damaged, it didn't yield, and you a bunch of pencil whip the analysis, and you it's possible to get it recertified. But basically, okay. if you take it above limit load, if you, if you exceed that, then then you, it's you, you own it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know? right. So, but you can't get it recertified. It it just has to go it's, through analysis and. It's possible, but not if you exceed it by a bunch. I mean, if you exceed right. it by three percent because you had an accident, right? You know, it, uh, but you know, if you take it to, I. And it's surprising how people get confused about this. They don't understand what is the purpose of the factor of safety. The purpose of the factor of safety is give you added margin or confidence in the design and the mm -hmm. analysis and what loads you're going to see. And it, it's, it's not so about it's not about workmanship. That's right. And this this kind of anecdotally, like whenever I walk onto an elevator and I see the the amount of people that are allowed on there yeah. or the weight, it's not like everybody's stepping on a scale before they get on the elevator, right? <laughs> right? That, right? That's not that's not how it works. <laughs> and so, like whenever I get on there, I know in my mind, like okay, you start like, counting bodies, not, right? I'm also not like trying to get everybody's weight like some magician to determine whether or not I'm getting on the elevator, right? Like I'm, this isn't a carnival trip where I'm like. All right, yeah. you look like you're about X amount of weight. Multiply that by how many people are on there, and then I think we're okay to go on this elevator. <laughs> so they've got a, a design load that they have to they've, meet. They've got a margin on that, that that's exactly. very high. But the same anecdotally, that's kind of the same thing we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. But the important thing is, to, again, to remember that that's to certify that the design and analysis and the use case are have – uh, sufficient margin or mature or good enough to go forward and start building uh, units that you're going to fly or, or use. Right. Now those have to go through acceptance. So there's qualification, which is a non-recurring one-off thing, typically destructive, right? Mm -hmm. And it does expend the vehicle, the, that article. But um, then the each unit, each tail number, each serial number going forward has to go through acceptance. Now, what's involved in acceptance? Well, it starts out with materials. You have to have certified materials with trace, if they're for fractured critical parts, you know, like this shell. You know, if it's safety flight critical, you got You have certified materials with traceability back to their uh, point of origin. So you know where they are. They aren't mystery meat, something that you got off the, the you know, Amazon, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I've seen a lot of mystery meat out in the industry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so you know, it's a known certified material. Yeah. Then you yeah, go. I saw through, some articles saying that they were getting carbon fiber that was <clears throat> that was secondhand carbon fiber. You know, I, I don't know. There Who was knows? an article that it was uh, expired uh, pre-preg from Boeing. Yeah. Okay, and I don't know if that's true or not. I don't either. Yeah, it's and okay. and um, An expired prepreg. That's that's. I mean, that's a difficult thing to qualify. Expired typically means it's cured, right? No, it's, what what happens with you know if it's if it's uh, they typically put a a, a life, life a freezer life. Life for it, you know, <clears throat> and if it if it uh, sits in a freezer too long and it's expired, and a big company like Boeing will then throw it away, right or so real quick, uh, Martin, uh, can you can you ex explain what prepreg is to all, some of the? Oh audience? yeah, yeah. That's um, uh, back in probably everybody has seen uh, you know bucket and brush composites. You have fiberglass cloth and a bucket of resin, and you put it in the mold and roll it roll the resin in the, with a roller. Well, that's that's an old technique. It's very um, it's not very good. It's okay for making a boat, maybe. Or patching something in your house, or right? You can go yeah. What what pre impregnated composites are or pre preg is the resin and the the reinforcement, which is the official term, or the fiber, and the matrix, which is the official term, or the resin, are um, 
um, impregnated in a factory under controlled conditions where you get controlled amount of resin and a controlled amount of fiber. And it's typically, uh, it's typically like 32% resin by weight, something like that. And they do this in a, you know, in a, in a temperature humidity controlled environment. And they, um, they've improved the technique. They improved it great in the early eighties when they, they used to do solution impregnating where they'd actually take a diluent, a, a solvent and, um, and, uh, put that in the resin first to make it easier to impregnate. Well, now they, they switched to what's called hot melt impregnation. So they got rollers that are heated and they take resin film and heat it and impregnate it into the material. And, and so, it made, made a huge difference in the um, quality of uh, composite laminates and really allows you to make big, thick parts. So what is, so give me a little bit, because I think this is relevant to the conversation. Can you express a little bit about the difference between somebody going out there with a bucket and brush and maybe some carbon fiber and then wrapping it around a tube and then rolling it out versus somebody taking something like a prepreg that is specific to a design call out, right? The lamination schedule of what those fibers are that get with what that resin is, is already done in the prepreg. So there's no user error necessarily in what that lamination schedule is. Well, there isn't any user error in the um, ratio of resin to fiber, right? Because right. that's controlled in a factory. And why would that be important in a situation like this? Well, it's very important because the resin has a, much higher thermal expansion than the fiber okay mm -hmm. and so the resin and the fiber work against each other as they cool down from the temperature and if you go colder like going down where they went you know they the the resin is shrinking faster than the fiber does and you get internal um uh you know um thermal induced stress in there and that mm -hmm. could cause micro cracking in the resin uh particularly if you have an uncontrolled amount of resin in there like if you had a sloppy bucket and brush approach you might have one part of the laminate's got more resin than 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 you uh, planned for and that resin will, will crack during cool down so having a um a nice you know well controlled prepreg is important which they used by the way right and um, the other is not to, not to use woven fabric. Uh, typically, if you're making your surfboard, you get woven fiberglass fa fabric, you put it on there and you put the resin on there and you work it in. Well, those undulations in the weave yep. cause places where there's pools of excess resin. And that's the point of micro cracking. So, yeah. so, so uh, theoretically then we get a micro crack. What happens when you put a micro crack in a submersible? Like let's well, let's say let's say let's say a micro crack happens and they don't check it don't catch it um, there's no sensors to detect it and they come up and then what happens if they go back down like tell explain the fatigue life of what happens with the micro crack well normally I wouldn't expect micro cracking really are micro cracks we're talking about you know uh, fifty microns right you know, length you know. These are not macroscopic things. Right. Um, over, if, if you got, and normally they're self-arresting between the layers of the composite, okay? They don't crack through, they, they stay within one ply. Um, particularly if you have, you know, your ply schedule, you have, you know, good cross-plying that you're doing as it comes up and you don't, don't, don't bundle together a whole bunch of parallel plies, you know, on top of each other. Right? It's the same the same reason you wouldn't bundle a bunch of parallel plies of hay going down the road with yeah. hay bales, right? They call <laughs> yeah, yeah, hay yeah. bales on purpose. Like if you see those square bales going down the road, the reason that giant stack stays on there is because those hay fibers are cross yeah. hatched. Same type of principle. Well, and yeah, and that's very important. And um, uh, otherwise, you would get a this this forcing function of the of the high thermal uh, expansion resin and the low thermal expansion fiber working against each other 
That's why you want, uh, you, first of all, you want a high uh, fiber volume laminate. That means, you know, you want 60% of the volume being fiber and 40% resin. And by weight, it's like 32%. Right. And so that the fiber dominates and you get a low thermal expansion uh, and you don't get a lot of, of um, induced thermal stress. Okay. Yeah. And I answer your question on the micro cracking. Normally, in some big thick lint like that, if it was designed properly on the SN curve, so it's not going, uh, you know, seeing stresses that are high enough that it's really causing damage in the composite, then micro cracking, true micro cracking, you know, 20, 50,000 um, microns would be self arresting and not very concerning. Um, even at that depth, really I mean, a, without all that pressure, that what is 6,000 PSI over time repeated. Well, it, remember that that 6,000 PSI is distributed across a big, thick laminate. Right. And so the stress and strain levels in the laminate, you want to have low enough that they're well within the um, design mm -hmm. allowables of the material, well within and with a good uh, design life. Um, so if so let's you, you talk about- You wouldn't want to design it, and there's no reason to right. make it so light. It's not flying. Right. To make it so light that it's that yeah. it's getting damaging <laughs> as it goes, and you have to check it every flight to make sure it's still okay. So well, how right. thick would- how th thick and heavy. <laughs> yeah, what? how thick would that be? Because aren't aerospace applications, they really don't go beyond what, a, an inch or so? Um, yeah, hardly ever. Uh, the B2 wing skins, the wing carry through skin that I did was about three quarters of an inch thick. And do we know how thick the submersible would have I've been? I just the, heard the that it was, you know, inches, you know, maybe up okay. to five, which sure. seems okay. like, and if it was actually five inches, that's, that's a lot more than I would think would be necessary, but right. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull on some scuba, some old scuba uh, <laughs> knowledge here. And so to be clear, I'm not a scuba diver. I got certified once. My my certification dive was the extent of my scuba yeah, me diving. Too. I'm exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to do more. Uh, I hope to do more. I just haven't gotten there yet. But what happens when you and well, I'm gonna refer to the bends. Okay, so. Yeah. You go scuba diving, right? You go down to every 30 feet, there's another atmosphere of pressure. And so you're compressing everything in your body. Like if you went down super deep and it was just your body and you get down there, like your skin just sucks to your skull and everything is all compressed. Um, and so the same type of deal happens with gas and air and pockets. So um, what what would happen then theoretically? And, and so the bends, for those of you that haven't sc scuba dive before, what happens is that there's air that you're breathing in and your body is metabolizing that air all of that air is compressed that you're breathing in that's coming from this tank and then when you go up if you don't allow that air to naturally expand and naturally mitigate throughout the body then the air can expand really rapidly and, and cause your blood to boil or gas and that gas is what what you don't want in your body and that gas is is called the bends essentially right um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty close. It, it, I'm oversimplifying it, simplifying it, but, but to, to the point is, is that if we had, if you start going up and down and you have a little bubble of, of air or a little bubble of delamination within a composite structure, now you're, you're cycling that, right? You're, you're pumping it up and then deflating it and then pumping it up and deflating it. And that's, that's dangerous for a composite structure, correct? Especially at the at the, when you're going down so many atmospheres. Well, um, not really. If you you're you're mixing up uh, in scuba diving, you're breathing compressed air from the tank, so that you um, uh, don't get pushed by the water pressure. Okay. Mm -hmm. In this submersible case, the inside is at one atmosphere. It's just atmospheric pressure of the right. air inside. And you, you, it's the structure that's reacting right. the, um, the pressure from the outside. So it'd be like if you are if you had an exoskeleton and it was strong enough that you could react to the water pressure. 
Right. So there isn't any source of high pressure gas, okay, like there uh, in this application to pressurize a void in a composite part that would then, when you came back up, would it would expand, okay, and and cause uh, uh, delamination growth. Okay. So, no, so that's great. So that's that's the question I had personally because that's well, that, that's from your experience from scuba diving. Exactly. But but scuba. So if like submarines, sometimes you know they 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 pressurize the hull to try to react to you know if they're under a depth charge in World War II submarine, they pressurize the hull so it's a little bit stronger and it can take the external pressure better. But in a submersible like that, there's no way you could pressurize it to 6,000 psi inside, you know, and and you know the people couldn't stand that. No, they couldn't. You know? So, so there isn't seen. there isn't any point in pressurizing the the hull to uh, try to partially react the external pressure. Yep. Mm -hmm. so it's just yeah. the the structure has got to be strong enough to do that, and the and the um, inside of the hull is at one atmosphere. Also, you know, yeah. So, so, so it's it's a different animal than what you're saying. You know, um, it, it's the thing in fatigue that I'd be more concerned about. It should be there is any reason why you couldn't design if you did it properly with a step by you know a, a building block approach and a proper mm -hmm. qualification article to ultimate load. There isn't any reason why you can design a long life composite cylinder like they have. Right. You might ask, why do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. um, but that's another story, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the, uh, the thing that is concerning and more complicated is the joints. Okay. That's right. The broad acreage of the shell, there isn't any reason why, if you did it properly and used proper materials, you couldn't make that work. Okay. Now the joints, that's where you could get some heel toe action where it's working back and forth, you know, because and that's the, coming from, and, and what is causing that? What is the physical force? Well, the, the, the composite has different uh, expansion and contraction and thermal expansion. Yeah. Right. Than the so titanium. Fatigue. You know, so, well, they're different, right? Yep. And so if you, when you design that joint, between the titanium and the composite, you have to design it so the strains match at the uh, interface. And it was an adhesive interface, it wasn't bolted. I learned that later. So they bonded the, a, a titanium ring to the composite shell. Wow. But you can't, you have to do that with finesse. You can't just yeah. make real stiff titanium <laughs> ring because it'll be stiffer than the composite shell, and they're going to work against each other, and your adhesive yeah. joint could could cut fatigue. Well, because your adhesive joint also has to match that type of fatigue. Well, that's well. why you want either adherin, the the yeah. titanium and the composite on the other side, have similar strain or flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. So so that they work together, mm -hmm. and the adhesive is under control. So that would be a place where you really wanted to. You know, you need an extensive development program there, a building block program where you, where you, uh, you know, you make simple little 2D element tests, you know. Yeah. And then you graduate that up to, you know, maybe a whole ring around, but it doesn't have to be the whole vessel, right? Right. And it, it's hard to simulate pressure in a tech like that, but you can if you work it. And, you you need that to help ground the um, structural analysis, because the the analysis of a joint like that it's it's a fine mesh, um, finite element model, and you have to do nonlinear uh, solutions on that because the the response is not linear. It's uh, as you press on it, it deflects less. Mm -hmm. you know, it starts to go, so it's a nonlinear response. But you have to ground that analysis with some basic tests. And then you have confidence to go forward. And finally, you build the qualification article that you test ultimate. Then you have to have really, like I said before, on those F-18 step lap joints, you have to have rigorous in-process controls 
when you actually do the bond on the uh, use article, the flight article, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, um, you know, you want to be in a clean environment. You want to. Um, you can't be in an open shop. Mm -hmm. You want to have a proper surface preparation on the titanium and the composite, and a proper primer on the titanium. The primer can't be expired. They don't last that long. I think on the F-18 step lab, I think it's 48 hours. I don't remember exactly, but it's something like that. Um, you have to very carefully, you have to apply the right amount of adhesive. They used a paste adhesive. Okay. But if you're using a paste right. adhesive, you have to make sure you're troweling in the right amount of it. Yep. And you also have to have some scheme that, that guarantees a minimum blue line when the yeah. two parts come there, that you don't scrape off the yep. base adhesive as you're bringing it down. So that's some sort of controlled yeah. tooling or guide that slides the one part over the other one. You can't just wiggle it on. Yeah. You know. Uh, it's so, fascinating. Yeah. Well, Martin, we're, we're, we're hitting our, uh, yeah, our, yeah. our mark here, but man, we, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion and I certainly appreciate Obviously, you joining, uh, Peter, you know, you coming on, you joining us, and it's uh, hopefully we can do a follow up again down in the uh, in the future again. Love to spend a little more time on your aerospace side of things and some of the work that you're doing there. Absolutely. Well, that'd be fun to do. I, I appreciate the, you know, your um, being in the call. And uh, yeah, again, I, I hope the, the families um that they, they do a rigorous accident investigation and come up with a determinate cause. Sure. That's right. And, yeah. And um, make sure that we learn and go forward. And Absolutely. Forward this kind of thing. Martin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I've got your website down at the bottom for our listeners uh, over at uh, McLaughlin Aerospace. Again, I want to thank you gentlemen for, for coming on. It's been, a, it's been a lot of fun today. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Anytime. Yeah. You bet. Thank you.